On behalf of CHM, I'd like to welcome each of you to today's program, BC Stories. I'm Marguerite Gong Hancock. I'm Vice President of Innovation and Programming here at the Computer History Museum and also Director of the Exponential Center, the museum's center focused on entrepreneurship. The museum's mission is to decode technology, its computing past, digital present, and future impact on humanity to shape a better future. So like fire and fuel, the combination of founders and funders is powerful and it's core to the story of economic growth and technology impact on all of our lives. So today's program is part of CHM's Venture Capital Initiative, which is dedicated to capturing and sharing the stories of VCs from the early pioneers to today's leaders. We're building an unparalleled collection, which already includes the largest set of video oral histories of venture capitalists, including the NVCA Venture Forward Collection, plus tens of other uh, additional interviews by the museum. This collection of VC oral histories uh, and artifacts along with educational content, along with programming content, uh, programming events like this um, are part of CHM's work to inform and inspire the next generation of innovators, entrepreneurs and investors. Today, we're gonna hear from Chuck Newhall, co-founder of NEA, a leading venture capital firm for nearly 50 years. Uh, he's a veteran VC and also a champion of the VC industry. He'll be sharing insights on what he calls the good, the bad, and the ugly of building firms as a VC. To uh, lead this fireside chat, we're thrilled to have Jim Swartz, uh, co-founder of Excel, another storied VC firm with over 50 years in venture capital and having been lead director of more than 50 successful companies. Jim is another pioneer and leader in the VC world. Jim and Chuck have been co-investors, competitors, and friends for many years, so it's a particular pleasure to have them here together for this fireside chat. Afterwards, we'll have a live Q&A session with both of them, so please share your questions through the Zoom Q&A feature. Now, let's hear Chuck and Jim's conversation. You and I have known each other, I guess, since the late 70s, right? Um, At least. The formation of NEA and uh, Arthur and I striking out on our own uh, is roughly parallel. So uh, we've, we've, uh, we're, we've shared the same time domain and shared many of the same experiences. Um, NEA and Axel have been in co-opetition for 40 years or so. Um, competition's uh, a word I love, we'll come back to it. Um, Tell us about the early days, the early days of NEA, and why NEA, why Frank, why Dick? I like to think of NEA when I think of a movie that Peter Sellers created called The Mouse That Roared. And The Mouse That Roared was about this really silly little 200-acre country in Europe living in the 18th century that decided to invade New York with a 20 man army. And uh, the little mouse ended up uh, 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 conquering the world and creating world peace. So it became this little tiny mouse that roared. When we all started, um, uh, that's what we were. Uh, we were going up against firms like uh, Venrock, which I think was in its fourth generation of managing partner at that time in the mid 70s. We were going up against uh, General Dorio of American Research and Development, Joan Payson of Payson and Trask, Bessemer, well established venture firms. And of course, in the West Coast, you had Arthur Rock and Tommy Davis and a whole bunch of others who sort of had planted a, a place on the monopoly board well before we were. And it really was uh, very interesting um, to see how, you know, we all began. Tell us a little uh, bit how you, how, you, how you got together with Dick and Frank and what, what, what was the bond among you? Dick, of course, was Arthur Rock's partner. And I got to know him uh, through Cub Harvey at T. Rowe Price. He and I worked together for seven years before NEA was started. Um, Frank was my uh, first wife's second cousin, and yeah. I know him. And I didn't know that. Yeah. He used to make uh, fun of me all the time. I remember going to a board meeting 
and uh, giving my analysis of the company. And Frank said, well, that little boy doesn't know anything. Why don't we go talk to some men anyway? So we had a great time together and uh, we were so much so different. You know, Dick was this established, uh, well-known venture capital capitalist in the West Coast. Frank was sort of a uh, a socialite, fox hunting, investment banker, bird dog man is what I used to call him because he knew everyone in the country and could find anything. And I was a bushy-tailed analyst, short on knowledge, but long on enthusiasm. And somehow I managed to talk Frank and Dick into joining. Uh, and it was interesting because, <clears throat> uh, you know, I considered venture capital, as you've described it, as a calling, not just a job. And my grandmother and my father had pushed it there. So I was, I'd known for years that I wanted to be in this business. And um, we all sort of divided up tasks. Dick led the investment side of the business. I worked on culture, marketing, you know, and handled healthcare investing. And Frank, you know, ran around the country finding every company you could imagine. We each, But we all respected each other. The problem was I'd read this book by James Clavell called Shogun. And it talked about Eiyasu Takugawa uh, founding the uh, shogunate in Japan that lasted 300 years. So I said, why don't we set up a partnership that's going to last 100 years? We had that as our goal. We actually put it in our marketing materials in the first fund that we were going to establish a firm that in the future would be, have the same position in the venture capital business that J.P. Morgan had in the investment business around 1880 or 1900. So I think most people just laughed and thought we were nuts, but a few invested, although they laughed at the idea too. But we were sort of determined and we kept on trying to do that. And that's very interesting, Chuck, uh, a couple dimensions. Uh, first, you know, Arthur and I had a very similar aspirations. We weren't quite as articulate as you to model ourselves after J.P. Morgan or that longevity, but we certainly had the objective of creating a firm that survived this. And uh, it was really the primary motivation and how we set everything up. You know, it's a popular misconception that venture people are all cut from the same cloth, uh, you know, privileged, whatever. Um, and it's just not the case. Uh, there's we come in many different stripes um so i th i think that's particularly interesting um let's move on to a little bit about you and you you love history uh you study it uh, you write it as in your recent book dare to disturb the universe which i recommend to everybody why is history so important and and why is the history of the venture capital world so important well, let me uh, make a uh, refer to a quote from Michael Crichton, I believe. Um, and he said, um, without, if you do not know history, you do not know anything. You know nothing. It is like being a, uh, a, a leaf that does not know it is part of a tree. I think history is so important because if you study it and know about it, you can make avoid mistakes and you can make better decisions on things that are the most important because really history just repeats itself over and over and over again. And there's so many things to be learned from the past that will help you to create the future. You know, you've single-handedly pushed all of us to document our roles in the industry, and uh, you've self-financed, many people don't know this, but you've self-financed the largest collection of oral histories in our industry. And you've encouraged many, including the Computer History Museum and Harvard Business School and others to document this history, and you've had a huge impact there. What else remains to be done? What else should the rest of us be doing to to you know, fill this out? Well, anyone who runs a venture capital firm should give their materials, like I have just done, 
to the computer museum and try to support the museum's attempt to put together venture capital history because all of that will be online. And for the first time in the history of the industry, scholars studying the industry can now access all of this data. Uh, the world is a very tricky place right now, as we all know, with everything that's going on internationally, nationally, the divisions in the country. And the venture industry is a precious resource I would say almost one of the most important resources that this country has, and it must be preserved. It must be, uh, you know, helped, and uh, and not uh, have laws passed that would somehow interfere with its function. And that's why it's important to know history, know the industry's role, which very few people understand today. Let's shift gears here a little bit, start and talk a little bit about um, our business. Um, I mentioned coopetition earlier. It's a word I love. I, in my mind, it defines our industry. We compete in the morning, uh, we cooperate in the afternoon, and we enjoy each other's company in the evening, hopefully. Um, that was the world we thrived in. Does it still exist? I think it still does exist, um, but I do think it's in danger. I think uh, <clears throat> uh, some of the younger generation of venture capitalists uh, uh, think the venture business is the way to make a quick buck. And the venture business, uh, as you and I know, is something that takes a long, long time, and you have to practice it with the utmost integrity and the issue is building companies. If you do the build a company successful, money will come. But what you're really about is changing the way the world is. I never, I think, uh, looked upon other venture firms necessarily as ruthless competitors because I actually was closer to other people that I worked with in other firms often than my partners because I was sitting on the boards with them. Mm -hmm. Now, um, <clears throat> most of the companies that I came, that came to me were referred by entrepreneurs that I'd worked with before, or uh, I, that was probably two thirds of the companies. And then uh, another uh, 20 so percent came from other venture capitalists that I'd worked with. And so I, I don't uh, think of, going in and getting into a bidding war uh, and competing with uh, a bunch of other firms. Maybe that was a characteristic of the healthcare business. I think the technology was much more traditionally competitive. I would you know, disagree that tech, the tech is more, more competitive or, uh, than healthcare was. Um, you know, I, I worked in both industries. Uh, for quite a period of time. Yeah, you I, helped start the sur surgery center business is one of the models. Surgery well. center business, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and early biotech and so forth. Um, so I, you know, I, I think it's, um, it's certainly one of the things that I enjoyed most about the industry was, was having friends in other firms that uh, I could bounce things off, share with and, 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 and so forth. Uh, so um, I don't know if it, if it's going to go away totally, uh, I hope not. Uh, let's let's hope for the best there. Well, um, I see it somewhat through Ashton's firm, which mm -hmm. uh, just was recently sold. And I think uh, that type of cooperative work is still going on with the young people today. Right. Um, yep. But there are so many temptations, um, you know, when billions of dollars are created in half a second. Yeah. That, that's what I was just going to say. I think that it's it definitely it still exists and will continue to exist forever. I think in the in the very early stage startup world. Let's talk about uh, one of your favorite subjects: bubbles. I know you <laughs> love bubbles. Um, we've lived and worked uh, in five, as I count it, five major boom bust cycles: uh, the late '60s, which uh, for those who remember with national student marketing and 
Bernie Kornfeld, uh, the Bernie made off of his day, do you sincerely want to be rich was the title of his book. Uh, then the early mid eighties, um, when many of the great technology companies were went public, such as Apple, Microsoft, and Oracle. Um, of course, the, the great bubble of the, of the late nineties, um, known as the internet bubble, but it, it, it encompassed much more than that. Then the financial crisis of 08, um, and now we're, what shall we call it? The QE, quantitative easing, crypto bubble. I'm not sure how it'll be described in history, but it's definitely a bubble. Um, what's your take on where we are now? And uh, talk to me about bubbles. Sure, I've loved bubbles, but let me go back in history because there's a wonderful book called Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. Mm -hmm. And it talks about, Bubbles going way back. I think my favorite bubble was the tulip bubble. You see, Holland started importing these exotic thing called tulip bulbs, and people thought they were so rare and unusual. Well, the price of tulip bulbs skyrocketed, skyrocketed, skyrocketed. And uh, one guy bought a whole bunch of tulip bulbs, his whole net worth, and he placed them in a table in his uh, living room and a bunch of friends came over, thought they were onions and ate them. Well, he lost everything, which is quite possible in a bubble. You think you've made so much money one minute and the next moment you lose it. But bubbles are often fundamental shifts. Just think of those tulip bulbs. Bringing those tulip bulbs created a very important industry for Holland. They're, they still export tulips all over the world. And so bubbles bring around fundamental change. But when they are in the periods of formation, there can be great excess, which often leads to great disappointments, collapses in value. But they do serve a very, very useful purpose. I happen to get very excited. I mean, genetic engineering, uh, think of what that's going to do over time. We're really very early in the process of that. And then I, I, I'm not a fan of crypto. Uh, I, you know, I'm skeptical about that. But um, artificial intelligence is another and, uh, 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 thing that I think is going to create a bubble and is going to have immense ramifications. So uh, from an investment point of view, how do, you, how do you live in a bubble? If you know you're in a bubble, you, I mean, how, how, how do you... How do you invest in a bubble, and 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 uh, how do you how do you know when the bubble's over? <laughs> well, if I knew the answer to that, I'd be a lot richer than I am today. <laughs> but I, I'll tell you one thing: I think it's best to be there first. Mm -hmm. So, um, what you like to do is create a bubble, like you've done in companies like Facebook and others, mm -hmm. where. Uh, you identify something very, very important, like we both did uh, together in um, uh, help to start the, uh, you know, internet. You uh, unit. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can get into one of those tidal waves and ride it early on, I think the second thing you have to learn is <clears throat> humility. Um, you know, <laughs> my father had a deal come into him once, and the guy who brought it in said, the shoes um, uh, that I make will enable you to walk on water like Jesus Christ. Well, um, uh, father said to him, uh, how do you do that? Well, he said, the people that make the shoes have to believe that. Well, believe me, in the venture business, you can't walk on water. And so when you're riding a bubble and you think you're a big deal, that's the time to be very scared. And so all of a sudden, focus on reality. So be there first and try to focus on reality and build companies that last when the bubble collapses. So your book, Dare to Disturb the Universe, does a fantastic job, a really fantastic job, describing the life of a venture capitalist. That's the thing I like about it the most. Uh, the ups and the downs, the, the drama, the trauma, the exhilaration. Um, there are a lot of interesting characters in the book, which which you describe so vividly. 
Um, let's talk about a couple of them. I, I know, for example, you, you, you love the Cramley PowerPoint story, the Anthony Montague Apple story, and a couple others. What, what, give us a little bit of color of some of the things that are in your book. So <clears throat> Anthony Montague was one of my mentors. <clears throat> he was the second son of Lord Rothschild. I mean, Lord Montague, but being in England, second sons don't get anything. So he had to go to work and he started, of all things, a venture capital firm, which his family had been in the merchant banking business. So it was sort of in his blood because merchant banks were really venture capital firms. So Anthony, you got to envision wool suit, proper British guy, and uh, he comes over. And the one-liner, uh, I don't pretend my one-liners are wisdoms, they're just observation, is you got to have the courage of your convictions. Mm -hmm. So Anthony goes to this little company, I think it was in a garage, and about 20 minutes into talking with the company, he uh, says, um, <clears throat> I'm not leaving this company until you let me invest. Well, the two entrepreneurs who were there starting the company sort of laughed and said, okay, Mr. Uh, Mr. Montague, you can stay here. They got him a Reuben sandwich, which was not Amy's, uh, his, his favorite. He stayed there four nights until he began to smell badly. And you can imagine what his breath smelled like after eating Reuben sandwiches all the time. And so one of the founders said, uh, um, well, I need to make money for a house. So Anthony bought 4% of Apple for $400,000. That's what I call having the courage of his convictions. That's a great one. Now, let me go to my partner and mentor, uh, Dick Kramlick, who I've learned a great deal from as well as uh, having a partner. And we called him, excuse me, I prefer to speak in Latin sometimes, Neil Desperandum, which means never say die. So Dick finds this little company, software company. No one thinks much about it. And um, uh, he wants to invest, so we do. Well, the company has a businessman and an English major running it. Well, they introduced two products that both bomb. And the English businessman quits all that's left at the English major. And the partnership says, no, we're not going to finance this company anymore. So Dick, on his own, spending $75,000 a month, finances it for seven months. Well, that English major was going around talking to customers, and he designed a product, and um, Microsoft bought the crazy company. The product was called PowerPoint, and that's how it came into existence. Now, Dick, we... Uh, Dick offered to sell the, his stock back at cost, but our limited partners uh, basically said, no, Dick, you can keep the profit because NEA made three times uh, on its investment when they would have lost everything. And it's because of your never say die attitude that that happened. So uh, never say die uh, is what we used to call Dick. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, th those are two small, two large, but uh, not wordy vignettes uh, from the book. Let me comment about um, Broken Field running, if I could. Sure. And a company called uh, Sepracore started out as a filtration company like Millipore. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> uh, they built a pretty good little business that way. Well, all of a sudden, the CEO, uh, who was very much of a technologist, um, says, I want to get in a new business. So we sold off 75% of the company that was having revenues and profits and put everything on a technology called chirally pure pharmaceuticals. Every molecule has a left and a right side. You purify them. And the right side of the molecule can have totally different characteristics of the drug than the left side. And so it offered a whole new potential generation of pharmaceutical products, totally changed the business model. And uh, that, I think, Sepracor generated products that had over $4 billion in revenues before it was sold. 
and the field of chirally pharma pure pharmaceuticals now is about 600 billion or more. I think the funniest one was Damon Labs, which started out as a defense electronic business and morphed into a clinical lab business. So whenever uh, you were the football star, uh, you know what broken field running is. My guess is it's when you get through the line, then you got to make it up on your own. You forget the play. You, you just move and dodge and get a touchdown. Hopefully. And, and today they're models of long-term success in the venture business. So they're both approaching or at 40 years and still going strong. Um, but they have very different strategies and cultures, the two firms. Uh, what are the defining attributes of NEA in your mind that have propelled it to this success over time? Yeah, um, I think there are many ways to build a successful venture firm and no one person knows, you know, the holy way or the only way. I think uh, I knew a venture capitalist who ran his venture firm like Putin runs Russia and still was a, uh, is a household name today, but I won't mention him. But anyway, go back to NEA. <clears throat> I think we had many, many things that made our culture and our culture was extremely important. Perhaps the most important one was that everyone had to win. That meant the entrepreneur had to win, the, the general partner or the limited partner had to win, the general partner had to win and our co-investors had to win. If we ever got in a situation where not everyone won, we knew we were in trouble. And that uh, uh, determined how we ha handled our comp uh, compensation, the fees uh, we charged, the share of the profits we took and how we took it. It determined everything. And, uh, and then the other thing we did <clears throat> was um, NEA was a, uh, maybe it was because I was a warrior and a military guy for uh, the first uh, part of my life, really, and almost made that a career. But I we modeled NEA on the band of brothers. Mm -hmm. So that meant that we were not a star system. We were a band of brothers. I think the ultimate expression of that is when you jump in a on a grenade, so you save the people around with them so they can accomplish the mission. Well, we basically de-emphasized the role of the individual star and tried to make this something that we were all sharing. The third thing I think we had was we wanted governance. When we went on the board of a company, uh, or when we invested in a company, we went on the board. So we expected our limited partners to be in our board. And at one time, they even approved our salaries and they approved all the strategic decisions, hiring and firing. We talked it over. But out of that relationship with our limited partners, they really made some important contributions to NEA, such as John, uh, Bon French from Adams Street, and um, uh, uh, Tom Judge uh, from AT&T, uh, they really uh, helped us come to grips strategically sometimes with what we were doing. They were, for one thing, uh, the ones that pushed us into venture growth equity. Um, they allowed us, um, <clears throat> when everybody got their uh, fees cut, um, after the bubble crashed, they raised our fees. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had people that invested in us. Uh, I think the investors in NEA, one contributed 50% of the capital. If you look how they descended and went into the fund to funds business, 50 to 60% of the money in NEA 10. So that relation with governance uh, provided an unusual relation with the people that funded us and they helped our business immensely. And I, I think just commenting on our own experience, uh, talking about sharing and one for all, all for one, certainly 
a, a big part of the culture of Excel. But it's, you know, in this in this world we live in of celebrities and instant celebrities, uh, it's a it's a battle, it's a real battle to, to maintain that culture. Um, so talk about investors. Uh, you and Dick and Frank are are very different as you described early on. You know, Arthur and I are very different. Um, what in your yeah, mind? Arthur, Arthur was a silver spoon and you were a tin cup, if not yeah. just holding your hands barely, out. <laughs> barely, barely. Uh, the, uh, what, what in your mind are the core attributes of, a, of that make a, a successful long-term uh, venture investor? Well, I think uh, you got to be able to do what I call look around the corner. I think you call that pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. And that is over time, after having been exposed to enough entrepreneurs, you can identify the beginning of the bubble. You can identify fundamental change. I'll never forget a meeting in uh, the early 80s or something and looking at a TV screen and one of our limited partners and this speaker gets up and he talks about um, this technology where all of a sudden you could go on a computer to a Swedish professor's house, walk through that house, meet his wife, meet his dog, get to know everything. You know what that was? That was the internet. And I just saw that and I said, God, the world is changing just right in front of me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so looking around uh, the corner, the other thing I have think you have to do, uh, have the courage to do the right thing. And doing the right thing is not easy. Uh, it means changing out a manager, CEO that you've been close to. It's mean not to cut any ethical decisions that a company gets into. And I think the other thing you need is patience. This is not a get rich quick business. It's a build a company business. It's step by step by step. And um, if you're in a hurry, you'll just trip over yourself and make a mess out of things. So have patience, have the courage and foresee the future. Great. So, you know, one one major difference between uh, NEA and Axel is our approach to healthcare investing. And, you know, while Axel had very successful healthcare and biotechnology practice early on, uh, we intentionally ceased investing in that area for, for a variety of reasons. Um, NEA took the opposite path and uh, was very successful with it. And talk to us about that. Well. Um, when we started NEA, most tell, uh, well, we really were nuts on diversification mm -hmm. because I believe that diversification is invest in investment is very good because you never know when one wave is going to obsolete the wave that came before. You never know where, what, where that wave is going to come from. So the more diversified you are, the more likely you are to be able to identify the way. So when we started out, a lot of venture firms in California were combined to computers and semiconductors. Mm -hmm. But NEA, right from the beginning, was looking at about 10 or 12 different industry areas. And we initially focused on healthcare and technology primarily. I think... Uh, a lot of that had to do with all three of our founders were very careful uh, um, uh, at home in both technology and healthcare investing, although we came to specialize. I went the healthcare route, uh, Frank went the technology route, I mean, uh, as, as did Dick. Um, I tended to do the stuff that they wouldn't do. Um, uh, but I also think that healthcare and technology are counter cyclical. Mm -hmm. And that is when health technology collapses, healthcare uh, can really uh, save the day. And I can point to times in NEA's history, several times 
uh, over whatever 40 plus years where healthcare has saved the day and technology has saved the day. But I think it's- yeah, totally That was certainly true in, the, excuse me for interrupting, but that, that was certainly true in the early 2000s when you know the, the tech world collapsed and, and healthcare came into its own there for a, a, good, a good period of time. And it was true before that when we had the first bloom in biotech. Mm -hmm. There yeah. were about two, two and, uh, and even recently, uh, mm -hmm. the healthcare uh, uh, side had uh, uh, carried, but tech carried the business many, many times. Mm -hmm. And there was always, we had, it was a continual struggle uh, right. within NEA, should we get out of healthcare uh, or not? Uh, but we stuck it through, and I think it was a good decision with us. But I think it you achieved diversification equally well just in the technology sector alone. Yeah. But I get worried when a venture firm has too narrow a focus. I gave a talk. Um, uh, it was I think it was the late late nineties, and it was a actually an NBCA so called debate. You know, healthcare versus I, because there was a lot of talk about it. And, and in preparing for it, you know, I, I took what I thought were the, the 30 most uh, popular, well, well used uh, acronyms from the tech world and, and the 30 most used acronyms from the healthcare world. And, you know, there's zero overlap. And so yeah. what that says is, and, and, and we saw this in spades in, in the partnership, it was incredibly difficult to have a coherent conversation uh, with people who were heavily focused on tech and then heavily focused on healthcare, because they, they just didn't speak the same language. We were speaking English, but it was a foreign language. And, and that is a huge management challenge. And you know, we, we chose to solve it by eliminating it, um, eliminating the conflict. You chose to solve it by you making it work somehow. And uh, oh, well, you, you did a great job with it. The way we made it work was, in a sense, we had two te uh, two firms. Yeah. Yeah. We had That's a technology firm within, and a, a healthcare firm. Our healthcare firm at one time had uh, 25 partners, and uh, they were six former CEOs of biotech companies, PhDs. Yeah. And eventually, it got so uh, complicated that a poor little English major like me hardly understood what was being said in those healthcare. And I, you know, we, we talk about this a lot and I always come down, you know, team wants to go in this direction, or that direction, which is better, which is worse. Uh, so, you yeah, know, it really doesn't matter. Uh, just pick one of them and you just, just choose what you want to do with your life. You know, do you, do you want to, you want to invest in really early stage things or do you want to invest in later stage things? It's, it's a choice, you know, it's not, one's not better than the other. And same thing with healthcare and, and technology. So. I also think that philosophically, both Frank, Dick, and I had a commitment to wanting to cure cancer mm -hmm. and do some of those things. It was just so it, it comes back to what you and your in your in your in your person want to be, right? Yeah. So that's really important to be yourself and do right. what's important to you. Um another interesting question. Um Constant question, age-old question. Uh, what's most important, the horse or the jockey, or the market, or the technology, or the entrepreneur? What do you well, think? Well, um, that's an easy one for me. It's the jockey. Mm -hmm. Because when you're in a horse race, the horse is a sign to the jockey. And... Um, he doesn't have a choice, but a good jockey in the entrepreneurial business can start out with one horse and shift to another if the horse's riding isn't fast enough. And I can, and I guess that goes back a lot to um, uh, the broken field running and how businesses can start out in one direction and then totally switch if you have the right management plus Ad adapting. So I think uh, you have to be conscious of what we call fertile fields or good uh, business markets to be in. But I, I think by far the thing you want to focus on is the jockey. And I think you feel the same way. Yeah, no, I come down pretty strongly on that side also. Um, there are many successful uh, 
many of our successful contemporaries come at it the other way and and uh, or another way. Uh, and uh, so there's there's no right or wrong. It's just again back to what you know what you're good at and uh, and, and and what you're able to accomplish and how you do it. Um, I just like to comment and and and, and uh, raise an issue which is is a troubling issue in the venture industry today, um, and uh, and that's the tendency for certain founders to feel they need to entrench themselves from day one, and and the corollary to that is boards who are missing in action. You know, it's it's at the core of some of the most talked about controversies today. You know, starting with Zuckerberg at Facebook, uh, Travis at Uber, and today, you know, Bankman Freed at, at FTX, you know, with a well known venture firm missing in action in its primary role. Uh, this is not venture investing as we knew it, uh, or as we know it also. Um, so, how do we get this self corrected and, 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 uh, and get back to a a relationship where entrepreneurs and venture capitalists, investors are able to respect each other, have a peer relationship and and work through things in the best way. Well, I hate to say it, but I think those are called bubble hangovers. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's when, you know, people have made money too fast. Everything has gone so right. And they think they can drink their own bath water as well as sell it. Mm -hmm. Big mistake. I think the thing that cures that are tough times. So uh, we have to have a really tough economic situation uh, that forces people to get back to the building of companies and basic building blocks. Uh, it's a discipline I whole think I think this whole country needs mm -hmm. is to um, you know, get back to working together and building things together. And the only thing that's going to bring that about is you got to get hit in the head when you're not behaving right a couple of times. Right. I'm <laughs> afraid I agree with you. Um, but be careful what we wish for, I guess. Um, well, that's life. Yes. <laughs> um, this has been fantastic. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I'd like to wrap it up with uh, some some of your one-liners i i know you're a big fan of that uh, i am too uh, there's a there's a lot of wisdom in them uh, give us some of your favorites and, uh, and, and and why they're your favorites but there are a whole bunch of them i know you've got a hundred more um outside experts don't have all the answers now really? I got this company and he was brought to me by a good friend of mine, a man I greatly admire, Ken Langone. Mm -hmm. And they were selling hardware. This company was selling hardware. And I fell in love with it. And they did that in a big warehouse. And I really wanted to invest in this company. But my a partner said, and I've got feedback, well, you got to bring in outside experts. Well, this company uh, had its first uh, a couple of facilities in Atlanta, and um, uh, uh, they were going to plan to open up in California. And I brought in two people, analyst at T. Rowe Price and someone who would actually been Dick's mentor and my mentor, who'd been number two at Kroger after being Howard Hughes's. And they said, well, company is going too far afield in its expansion. They'll never be able to duplicate the lease structure. And I turned down buying 10% of Home Depot for a million dollars. And uh, of course, the company went to Florida, which was the logical place. They got better leases and the rest is history. Mm -hmm. So you really can't. Another thing I uh, uh, like is we had our partner, um, by the name of Ben Prothro, and he was an old Texan, and he had sayings, are the dogs eating the dog food? And, uh, uh, you know, uh, the issue is uh, when you get a product, you fall in love with it, the entrepreneurs fall in love with it. The question is, 
you got to go out and see whether the market is really there. Mm -hmm. or is it really demanding this product? I can remember uh, financing one company early in my case, and I was damned and determined to make this company successful. But the problem is the dogs weren't eating the dog food. Right. Anyway. Yeah, um, there's a corollary in the market, you know, which goes back to when we used to have ticker tapes. You can't fight the tape. Right. You know? If the and tape the goes south, you can't change it. And the worst thing you can do is build a bridge to nowhere. Right. Because right. when the dogs aren't eating the dog food and you bridge that company, A, B, C, D, the bridge goes to nowhere and you're out in the middle of the river and you drown. <laughs> done, been there and done that. <laughs> yep, absolutely. All right. Well, we could continue on and on and on with this, Chuck, but uh, we got to let all of our uh, viewers get back to something more productive. Uh, what uh, you got any final vignettes for us that you want to leave us with? One thing you have to do think about, I think, is when you invest in a company. You got to talk. This is another uh, thing, an entrepreneur to what we used to call the management resignation box. Mm -hmm. You got to have a serious discussion and say, you know, if the dogs aren't eating the dog food or the business doesn't turn out, there will be a time when we will have to step in and bring in someone who can run the company right. Now, I've had to do that 60 times, at least in my career. It's extremely painful. And uh, so it's best to prepare for it. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think that's important to keep in mind is it changes the investor's only certainty. That's a one-liner. And the Goliaths can be hit in the head and destroyed. You know, railroads didn't anticipate the automobile industry. IBM did not anticipate the mini computer or the personal computer. So if you hit Goliath in the head, he can fall. I could go on and tell stories like this, but probably everybody's be asleep by the time I finished. Yeah, well, this has been great, Chuck. And um, I, uh, I just want to applaud you again for prompting all of us to uh, get some of these episodes, some of these life experiences uh, down on paper, some of these learnings for the future. And um, Hopefully, uh, you can. We'll all work hard to continue this practice of documenting documenting the industry. And for those out there who want to join us, uh, Chuck has lots and lots of uh, helpful things uh, to talk to you about. Uh, would encourage you to uh, reach out to us and uh, continue this conversation. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And thank you, Jim, for everything you've done for me for the past 40 years or however long it's been. Thank you so much, Chuck and Jim, for your wide ranging conversation. And, and now it's time for our audience to join in the conversation through some of the questions, answers that have uh, questions that have come in today. I'll kick off uh, with one. I think, Jim, this one might be for you. This one says, during the past month, we've lived through the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and its aftermath. Uh, how do you make sense of these events? And can you share your perspective or any takeaways? Well, we could talk a lot about Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, there's an enormous amount that's written on it. Um, it's a pretty simple failure. Um, and uh, I, just, I think it's... Uh, People need to go read Finance 101 again. Uh, and, uh, you know, with, with been a whole generation uh, that have come along that don't understand what interest is and don't understand the role it plays in, in the economy. So um, we could go on and on about the public policy side of it. Uh, should you insure, shouldn't you insure? But that's ultimately a political discussion whether you're a big government, a little government, and uh, whether you protect or whether you let the free market work. And, uh, I, I don't think this is the place for that conversation, but uh, I think it was a it was a good wake-up call to everybody who's been lulled asleep by quantitative easing. Um, it's time to get back to basics. 
Okay, great. Thank you for that. Here's a question that comes from Grace and Kinsella. If you were early in your career, and I think this is one that we'd like to hear from both of you about, if you were early in your career and just starting out in venture capital right now, how would you spend your time? Chuck, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, I just had a good friend of mine, son, who is, uh, he was, father was one of the most famous baseball players in history. And he couldn't make it in baseball. And he's now trying to get into sports broadcasting. So how do you start? I said, get noticed. Do something in your particular field of interest. In my case, I think I'd run a section of the New Horizons Fund for a period of years and had a 50% compound rate of return on that. Uh, and I think that attract gave people who would be backing us. And the other thing was I picked the right people to be partners with who happened to be more skilled than I was. So, uh, you know, excel and pick the right partners. Thank you. Jim, your thoughts, please. Um, I would I would call it get really, really smart on a specific area that you love and become an expert in it. Um, doesn't take that long. Go to all the conferences, figure it out, become an expert in it. And and secondly, and this is a life message, you know, hang out with the right people. Um, always find people smarter than you to hang out with and people you can learn from. And uh, they're there. You just need to find them. And, and uh, people tend to be very open about helping other people. Um, Thank you. Eric asks, I would like to hear each speaker discuss the one that got away or the one they met and declined the investment uh, or a, failure, a favorite failure. Jim, do you want to start on that one? I want to hear that. Uh, look, I've had plenty get away. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, in my own case, probably the one that, you know, I tended to focus in the data communications, telecommunications world. I didn't do Cisco. How the hell did I survive? By not doing Cisco, well, I did. Uh, I, you know, it, it, we didn't do it for a variety of complex reasons. But it, it, look, plenty have gotten away. I don't think that's the right question. I think the right question is, is what do you, you know, how do you handle that in the firm? How do you process? How, how do you uh, set a climate where you can acknowledge that you failed in certain things by not investing in certain things? Everybody sees the failures; they're very visible. But, but the insidious problem is the ones that got away and, and the, the, that you had in your grasp or for whatever reason you missed. You just, uh, at Excel, we started a practice uh, very early on, you know, generally once a quarter, certainly once every half of, of sitting down and, and uh, going through a disciplined process of all the projects that our competitors had done um, that we didn't do, and why? Why did they do them? Did we did we miss something? Did, did we look at it and turn it down? What was what were the issues? Why why didn't we do it? Um, so, I think it's more important to focus on the process and and, and the openness among your people than is any any individual stories. So. Great insight, thanks, Jim Chuck. What's your perspective on this? Well, I'll tell you Sorry. first as an investor, and the one that got away was Home Depot, which I've already discussed. And the reason it got away was I had, did not have the courage of my own convictions in following my beliefs. And I brought in a bunch of outside experts and I relied too much upon them. In the case of an um, uh, entrepreneur making a mistake, uh, and I think that happens often is the dogs are the dogs eating the dog food. Are you financing a company where the market is coming back to you and saying, we want this product. It is revolutionary. What you have is unique. Make sure that the product you're riding or the technology that you're riding uh, has those characteristics. Excellent. Thank you. This, uh, Thread comes from both Pian Pian Shu Guthrie and Hema Manlikar. Both of them are early stage founders and they're asking um, together similar questions. What are keys for a startup to succeed? 
And any words of wisdom for an uh, for a early stage founder? Chuck, do you want to start with that? Yeah, I'd give the same advice. Uh, I can't ask that they're married because that's not correct. At least I would have. Oh, these are two. These are two separate people who ask the question. I know, I know, but (laughs) but same. I would ask the same question of someone getting married. Oh, I see. Have you picked the right partner? Mm. Because uh, when you uh, you know, start your business, the people that you get uh, into business with will determine your future, both whether they be your employees or whether they be your partners in a venture firm. So make sure you pick the right partner who basically shares the values that you have. If you have different values when you set out, you're going to run into conflict. So do two things, pick the right one and make sure they have your values. Thank you. Jim, anything to add? So we do that, I, I would add, I think the attribute that I value the most and that I see is, you know, a, a common su- attribute among successful people is, you know, there's a fine line between being open and being convinced of something. Um, and you know, successful entrepreneurs have that ability to be open to new ideas, to open the I mean, they're they're up there, they're leading the company, they're saying we're going to do this, we're going this way, where this is what we're going to do, and, and and present conviction, and they need to have conviction themselves uh in a big way, but they simultaneously need to be listening and being open to what the feedback is. And what what feedback are they getting from their employees, from their peers, from the marketplace? And uh, sometimes, as Chuck's talked about, you need to crash, you need to push, 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 and push through. Sometimes you got to stop and say, wait a minute, uh, what's the market telling? Yeah, wait a minute. I have a one-liner on that, which uh, I have a one-liner on that, which my partner, Vin Prothro, told me. When you start a company, make sure you don't have cement ears, which is be open. <laughs> Things change. You yeah. got cement ears, get rid of them. Uh, it's a fine line. It's not an either or. You, you. Some people are too open. They'll sit around in a in a in a you know a company meeting and they'll have fifty inputs and they get confused and they don't know what which one. It's <laughs> it's, uh, it's a fine line. All right, well, here comes a question from Dottie Hayes. Um, Jim, I'm gonna toss this one to you. How do we truly make progress on fostering diversity in the venture industry and availability of capital to women and people of color? Yeah, I think you look, uh, the industry's made a lot of progress. It has a lot of ways to go. Um, It's a very, very challenging, demanding industry. I, you know, I come back to the, to um, the, uh, the the nature of the of the real venture capitalist and, and investor is a calling, and so people need to decide this is what they're going to do. If if, uh, if 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 people there, we we have a lot of diversity in our firm. Uh, we always have. Uh, we've always prided ourselves on it. I think that. Um, but you just can't reach down and, 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 and create the yearn to want to be an investor. It's a tough, tough uh, business and people need to um, learn uh, and, and be disciplined uh, about getting into the business. So I think for, pe- for people who want to uh, take the risk and, 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 um, uh, and so forth, uh, there's, the doors are wide open. And I, I sincerely believe that. I, that's the way I've always operated our firm, and uh, I know many others do too. Thank you, Jim. Chuck, I'm going to ask you for some final comments as you look at the venture industry today. Any thoughts about both the promise or the perils ahead for the industry at this juncture in time? Uh, I guess I've never been more optimistic about the rate of fundamental change that's going to be occurring in this company technology. It's just going to open new doors that we can't even conceive. So I'm very optimistic 
about the future of the industry. The question is, uh, do you have the courage of your convictions to change the way the world is today? And you have to have that purpose. I remember watching a crazy Broadway musical called Avenue Q. And the, uh, it was based on Muppets and a guy who went to Princeton. I don't know why anyone would back a person from Princeton. I looking at one right now, but some people do. Anyway, what Princeton learned in this uh, play was you got to have a purpose, a mission to accomplish. Well, Jim and Chuck, thank you so much for your sharing your time and experience with us and the CHM audience today. It's been a great pleasure to have you with us. We'll be sharing this conversation online, and I invite all of our viewers to explore even more in the museum's collection about our venture capitalists and venture capital industry. As we close today, I wanted to invite all of the viewers to join and give to support the museum as, as members, as subscribers, so that you can learn about future events and be part of this movement and purpose that we have. On behalf of CHM, thank you again to Jim and Chuck for all you do and who you are, as well as to all of viewers for joining us today. Thanks again and bye-bye.